Dr. Alan Goldhammer, for people who want to cleanse their brain, burn fat, and stop disease, why do they need to try pure water fasting? Well, I mean, I think the first thing we've got to talk about is, you know, why we need to fast. And that's the idea that, you know, the problems most people have in our society today are a consequence of dietary excess. So they eat too much, they get fat, and part of that fat is visceral fat. Somewhere on average of around 10% of adipose tissue is visceral fat. Visceral fat's the material that tends to accumulate around the belly uh, and the organs. And it's hypertrophic, it's hypermetabolic. It acts like a tumor. So when a person has 20 pounds of extra fat and a two pounds of extra visceral fat, it's essentially like having a two pound tumor on their abdomen, giving off inflammatory products that cause disease like cardiovascular disease and diabetes, autoimmune disease and cancers like lymphoma. When you think about those leading causes of death, you realize they're treated as if they're completely separate entities. You have to go to different doctors to even be diagnosed and treated by these conditions, and yet they all have something in common. Dietary excess, excess fat, excess visceral fat, inflammation, and disease. So then the question is, okay, why are we having so much trouble with obesity and so much visceral fat? Why are we developing diseases that used to be rare, but that are now common? Diseases that used to be called the diseases of kings, because it was only the wealthy elite kings could eat the processed foods that led, led to the obesity and the, the gout and the heart disease and these things that used to be rare. And the reason is uh, what we call the pleasure trap. The idea is that the artificial stimulation of dopamine in our brain that comes from the chemicals we put in our mouth allow us to bypass the satiety mechanisms and lead to overeating. And the chemicals that we put in our mouth that fool our brain are salt, oil, and sugar. Salt, oil, and sugar are not food. They're hyperconstituted byproducts of food that are added back to food to make food taste better. And that's what tasting better means. It means the artificial stimulation of dopamine, the neurochemical associated with pleasure, as a consequence of increased caloric density. So the idea being, we put the chemicals in the food, we fool the brain, and now 72% of people are overweight or obese. If you're not overweight, you're abnormal. You don't want to be normal. You want to be healthy. Healthy people are not overweight. They don't have the obesity and the visceral fat, and they have much less risk of developing these diseases of chronic uh, dietary excess. Now, it turns out that there's a bit of a hack to get rid of visceral fat, and that turns out to be fasting. So fasting, that is the complete absence of all substances except water in an environment of complete rest, gives the body a chance to preferentially mobilize visceral fat. In fact, we've done a study at the True North Health Center where we do medically supervised fasting, and we took a DEXA scanner with the software necessary to do detailed body composition analysis, and we looked at what happens to people when they fast. And it turns out one of the things that happens when people fast is they lose weight. And some of that weight is water, some of it's fiber, some of it's protein, some of it's glycogen, some of it's fat. And when you come off the fast and you, re, and you begin eating again, you gain weight. And the weight you gain after fasting is water, fiber, glycogen, and protein, but not fat. Fat continues to come off, assuming you're eating uh, a healthful program after fasting. And it turns out if you take a person, say, that fasts for two weeks on water only, they're going to lose on average about 10% of their body weight. But they're going to lose 20% of their total fat and 40% of their visceral fat, wow. only 6% of lean tissue. And at six weeks follow up in our study, the percentage of body from lean tissue is actually higher than at baseline. So they recover the lean tissue, they put glycogen back in their muscles, they get fiber back in their gut, they rehydrate, but the fat loss continues. And uh, so the important thing is it's actually a reconstitution of the body composition. Now, if you're patient over time with diet and exercise, of course, you can lose fat and you can lose visceral fat. It's just this is a, a, a faster track, and that can be important for people that are being treated with medications. You know, if people are, have high blood pressure, they have diabetes, they have autoimmune disease, they have cancer, they're told by their doctors, look, diet doesn't matter. Take these pills, and we guarantee you, if you do exactly what you're told, you'll never get well. You'll be sick the rest of your life. You'll be on these medications forever because they don't deal with the actual cause of disease. They deal with the leading cause of death. They'll, they'll treat symptomatically your cardiovascular disease, not actually getting rid of the reason why you have the high blood pressure. 
It's interesting with medications, you can take high blood pressure medicine to lower your blood pressure, but it won't lower your heart disease risk. Mm. Then there's people don't have lower heart attack risk because they take medications to lower their, their blood pressure. They may have lower stroke risk. That is where their potential benefit comes in lowering hypertension, reduce your risk of stroke. But the majority of people that are dying from cardiovascular disease are not going to be benefited by taking these pills. And in fact, they may be severely harmed because chronic cough, fatigue, impotence, and actual premature death are the consequences of this kind of medical management. Oh, you're speaking my language. Um, it's such a brilliant subscription model, isn't the sick care system? Uh, evil and brilliant. Those symptoms. Yeah, and those it's symptoms. Never been more lucrative. <laughs> so lucrative. And the truth is, I mean, you look at these recent pandemics we had with with uh, COVID nineteen. Uh, besides age itself, the leading cause of death and disability from COVID was obesity. Yeah. The more fat you have, the more visceral fat you have, the higher your risk of dying. And yet none of the public service announcements ever mentioned overweight as being a major risk factor because that would be blaming the victim. And, and it's not politically correct to acknowledge that being overweight is not just an aesthetic problem. It's a major vulnerability to death and debility. Right on. And it's a victim mindset, which enables people to just eat what they want and not care about their health. And we see that all over the place. I mean, when we look at the stats, the it shows in nineteen the year nineteen thirty, what obesity was one percent or less here in the U.S. Now it's Harvard is saying by twenty thirty it's going to be fifty percent. There's a thought that it's a genetic problem, but from my understanding, our genes don't change that fast. Could you debunk that notion that the reason we well, have this obesity crisis is because of our genetics? Yeah, for 200,000 years, modern humans lived on the planet with very little obesity, except for the, occasionally the kings were developing the disease of dietary excess. But for the last 200 years, since the Industrial Revolution, we began changing the nature of our feed. And what we did is we went from having a rare thing like sugar being in the diet to we're 150 pounds a year uh, on average. And I don't have any of it, which means somebody's eating my share too. You know, there's a really serious problem now with the drug-like effect of hyper-concentrated chemicals added to the feed. And that's why we have the epidemic obesity. Um, if you take people and you realize that the food is a carrier agent now for salt, oil, and sugar. For example, if you take beef and boil it, you're not gonna really enjoy gnawing on boiled beef unless it's got the salt and the carrier agents, it's being used as a carrier agent to get it to your palate. If you take bread, which is a you know, commonly consumed product, has 1,500 calories a pound compared to 500 calories a pound for your, for your wheat berries or your rice or your, or your whole grain, that's three times caloric density because you, you grind it into a flour, you dehydrate it, you add salt, oil, and sugar. If you take bread and remove the salt, oil, sugar, and yeast, you get something called matzah, and it's punishment on Passover. <laughs> so the idea is these foods are carrier agents um, for the salt, the oil, and the sugar. People are having a drug-like effect. They take the sugar, their blood sugars go up, the insulin goes up, it drives the sugars down, the brain thinks you're starving, now you've got cravings and binging and all kinds of problems. When you remove the salt, oil, and sugar, you remove a lot of the problems in terms of fooling satiety mechanisms. You eat to your full, and, and that is uh, gonna balance out a, a more normal, healthy weight. I'd love for you to share more about, you mentioned doing those DEXA scans and you see that when somebody does a fast, they're losing uh, visceral fat, they're losing, losing body fat, they're, they're also losing their, are uh, burning through their glycogen stores, they're burning, they're using fibers and different proteins. There's a myth out there or a thought that muscle loss occurs with, with fasting. It does, there's 6% lean tissue loss, but the point is there's a minimal amount of glucose that's needed when people fast to maintain, uh, a small percentage in the brain and, and muscles. And so there's going to be a little bit of gluconeogenesis. Now, if you're active in fasting, if you're exercising, if you're doing things we're recommending against while you're fasting, you will have significantly more gluconeogenesis that'll be required. You'll have a, a, a greater breakdown of protein. One of the keys to fasting is that um, you do take it easy in fasting. You're not driving, going to work, et cetera, on longer term fast, you're resting. And that's going to maximize fat and particularly visceral fat mobilization and minimize protein loss. The important thing is we track those same patients at six weeks after fasting as they went back on a whole plant food SOS free diet. They regained all of their lean tissue. And as a percentage of their body, their lean tissue mass actually made up a higher percentage of body than it did at baseline. The only thing that kept coming off was fat and particularly and preferentially visceral fat. It's just like in fasting, when you fast and you have a tumor, 
say a breast tumor, you, you lose 10% of your body weight, you won't lose 10% of your tumor, you might lose 20% or 50% or 100% of your tumor, because the body is preferentially mobilizing nutrients in inverse proportion to their need. And as a consequence, you can break down tissues that shouldn't be there preferentially. And that's exactly the case with visceral fat. Visceral fat shouldn't be there in quantity. It's there because the body had no place else to store fat. And in an environment of scarcity, storing fat is critically biologically necessary so that you can survive periods of vulnerability called, you know, when spring comes late or if you're a female pregnancy. And so the, the idea is biologically, you're designed to store as much fat as you can, eat as much as you can. Um, and in a natural setting, that works great because there's never dietary excess or highly processed foods. In the modern world, you're totally screwed, which is why, you know, the majority of people are overweight or obese because they're eating these foods and they're being fooled. Can you share more about what happens to the immune system? I know one of the... The, the negative uh, thought process to fasting, I believe it was in the early 2000s, it might have been Dr. Walter Longo's work, is that they see a reduction in the white blood cell count showing that fasting weakens your immune system. But what happens after is what they failed to, to, to well, share. No, so actually, sure. Walter Longo's work was excellent because he showed, uh, and first of all, Yoshinori Yoshimi in 2016 won the Nobel Prize for Medicine for his work on autophagy. And autophagy is basically self-eating, how the body eats up the cancer cells and gets rid of them, eats up the old, decrepit, decaying cells, recycles the critical nutrients. And we know one of the things that increases autophagy is fasting. Fasting profoundly increases autophagy. In fact, if you take rats and periodically fast them, you can double their lifespan. And we don't see a recurrent infection. In fact, quite the opposite. People coming in with acute disease oftentimes get uh, healing that doesn't take place and feeding that does take place during fasting. All the objective measures of immune system function tend to be accentuated during fasting, neutrophil, phagocytosis, all these enhanced um, aut autophagic you know, processes. So it's quite the opposite. Now, one thing that does happen is they notice that white counts tend to drop during fasting, but immune function didn't drop and they couldn't explain why until this autophagy work was understood because what happens is old white cells age out and the body recycles them. Well, in fasting, that processes dramatically sped up. So a whole bunch of non-dysfunctional cells are cleaned out. Total counts go down, but those count, those cells weren't functional anyway. So your absolute counts go down, but your actual immune system function is retained. And then you actually generate new cells that are actually fully functional. So the idea that the total, you know, just counting white blood cells and saying, yes, they go down in fasting. Absolutely. They do. It's just like they, they mistakenly understood what was happening with lipids. Cholesterol levels can go up profoundly during fasting. Because we're, fat is mobilized from inside your blood vessels. It contains a lot of cholesterol. Where do you think that goes? Into the bloodstream. So if you suck some blood out and you analyze it, of course there's going to be increased uh, issues during fasting. Uh, that doesn't mean that you're uh, causing cardiovascular disease. In fact, quite the opposite. We know that uh, atherosclerotic vascular disease reverses during fasting and with dietary and lifestyle change and with weight loss, et cetera. So I think... This is the reason why people want to read our book, Can Fast and Save Your Life, because we've gone through and looked at the not only our 22 original articles, but the work that others like Walter Longo have done and really helped people understand, you know, the meaning of this information. And, and it's one of the rare books that's really built on uh, the author's original research. Um, I do have to say Walter Longo has been a fabulous pioneer. He's a USC professor been publishing on intermittent fasting, his group developed Prolon and, you know, some of these other procedures. And he wrote a book on fasting and he said that people should never do the kind of fasting we recommend is prolonged water only fasting. But there is one caveat, he said, which was if they did it at the True North Health Center. Now, I evaluate other researchers' intelligence based on how much they agree with me. So that book's make Walter Longo a genius as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> Let's discuss the metabolism. What's happening to the metabolism during these fasts? So we've had people here with calorimetry machines. We looked at this, this, this old wives' tales that me metabolism slows down and now it's going to be possible to gain fat after fasting. And really what happens is, yes, metabolic rate slows while you're fasting. It's a conservation mechanism. And it comes back to normal after fasting. By the time you fed for the length that you fasted, metabolic rate function has been restored. What does improve though in fasting is absorption and digestion. Mm. So people have this active microbiome in their gut. They have maybe trillions of creatures, maybe five pounds of organisms swimming around in their gut. And these organisms are living creatures. They're eating, drinking, breathing, and defecating inside you. 
And so to, what they poo in you depends on what you feed them. So if you feed them, for example, a whole plant food diet without salt, oil, and sugar, you have a thousand strain of organisms that are you know, working together synergistically to protect you and nourish you and feed you. We do know that depending on what you feed them depends on which type of organisms you have and what their poo is. Some people have poo that's very high in TMA, which is trimethylamine oxidase, which causes heart disease and is a big problem. Well, that tends to be associated with higher animal food intake. So the more animal food people eat, the more TMA they have, the higher the risk for colon cancer and other issues. So diet definitely plays a big and important role. People on high sugar diets have completely different uh, fermentation process organisms than people that are not eating refined carbohydrates. So a little bit actually can make a big difference and a lot can make a huge difference in terms of your dietary lifestyle issues. Um, fasting has a very powerful effect at rebooting that gut microbiome. In fact, some of the first studies done on long-term fasting and the effect of diet were done here at True North Health Center. In fact, our first paper in a series that was done appeared recently in preprints in Lancet, and it talked about some of the inflammatory things that go on, like inflammation goes up during fasting. Absolutely, because inflammation is a part of how the body heals itself. So you'll see inflammatory markers go up, but then you see them, if you follow them, as we have done six weeks later, they not only go back to normal, but they actually go down further at, with an improvement and a reduction, which is why some of these inflammatory diseases do so well. During fasting, you may have some significant healing crisis where you feel miserable, but as a consequence of fasting, these conditions like rheumatoid arthritis and other conditions often respond well. So that's why, again, you gotta really be careful in looking at the numbers that come back with the lab because if you just look at it one time point say during fasting you may misinterpret what you're seeing as a bad thing when it's a very good thing and a critical part of healing what, what were some of those inflammatory tests that you looked at to that went up during a fast and then went below their baseline afterwards basically all your acute phase reactive proteins il6 tnl alpha crp you name it the, if you if it measures inflammation it's likely to be uh positively impacted by fasting but may notice some elevations during the fasting process itself. Okay. And what's the time, the duration that you recommend is three to five days of a water fast every quarter enough to get these results. What would be a recommended uh, length and duration and frequency? Well, it's a highly individual situation in order to know if a person should fast first, you have to determine, are they a candidate for fasting? So that means medical history exam and lab. In other words, many people who might be harmed by fasting shouldn't be fasting. Uh, they're contraindicated. And some people are indicated. The way you do that is you work with your doctor to get a proper medical history, a, a physical exam, and laboratory testing. There's some, and again, we've, we've outlined it in our book. One of the things that's great about this book is it tells people what they can expect, but it also tells their physicians what they need to know to be able to guide them safely through this process. Now, we fast patients that are with, have, with health conditions up to 40 days on water only. Mm. And so some conditions don't even start responding to 20 days into fasting. You may not even get, you know, not even get to it. It takes five days just to get into the whole metabolic adaptation. So the short-term fasting is really more about healthy people doing preventative care. So people that are healthy, that have normal weight, normal blood pressure, normal blood sugar levels, they also get benefit. In fact, we've done a study recently looking at exactly that question. When you take metabolically healthy people and fast them, do they get benefit? And it turns out, Metabolically healthy people, first of all, they're very rare. Only 12% of the population are metabolically healthy, and only 3% of the population do even most of the basic rudiments of health. That is, they don't smoke, they get sufficient activity, they're eating what, like, quote, healthy diet, whatever that means, and that they have a percent body fat if they're male of less than 20% or a female of less than 25%. That's not heroin addict thin, but, you know, they're maintaining reasonable levels of leanness. Only 3%, 97 people out of 100, actually 97.3. I don't know what the 0.3 person looks like, actually. <laughs> I was wondering about that. But 97 out of 100 don't meet that even most basic standard. Only 12% of people in our society are not overweight uh, or obese so, or, the, or underweight, you know, the other side of it. So first of all, it's rare. But of those people, when they fasted, we, we recruited metabolically healthy people for a study. Do you know we had the most trouble, we had no trouble finding sick people. Oh my God, hypertension, diabetics, cancer patients, no problem. But when we started recruiting healthy people, it was so difficult. We actually had to recruit from the staff at the True North Health Center. Wow. Because those are the only people we find that were actually metabolically healthy people eating this whole plant food diet, exercising. And uh, anyway, 
when we fasted those people, as beneficial as fasting was in sick people, the, by percentage, the magnitude of change in cardiometabolic risk factors, et cetera, in healthy people was actually greater than the sick people. The healthy people started off with normal blood pressure, but got additional improvement that improved their markers of health even more proportionally than the sick people. So what we believe is a healthy person should fast every day for 12 to 16 hours. Don't eat three to four hours before you go to bed. If you're trying to lose weight, delay breakfast in the morning till you've had a chance to do some exercise and disproportionately burn fat. If you're healthy, you might be on a 12 hour rather than a 16 hour window. But the point is you're still fasting every day. You're still not eating three to four hours before you bed. And once a year for a week or two, you're gonna take some time off and rest and do a, a longer term water fast. Now, exactly how that should be has some individual variation. And also, that's the subject of a study that we're doing, trying to figure out exactly what the best formula is for long-term healthy life expectancy. Not just life expectancy, but healthy life expectancy. Let's face it, how long you live is largely determined by genetics and luck. But how well you live is determined by your diet and lifestyle choices. You can increase life expectancy a little bit, but you can increase healthy life expectancy profoundly. So people that don't um, smoke, that eat well, will live a few years longer. But people that are living healthy have sometimes decades less stability. Most people find themselves unable to talk or move lying in a nursing home bed waiting for people to change their diaper after they've had a heart attack or stroke. And they um, have years or decades of debility as a consequence of their behavioral habits. People that live a healthy diet and lifestyle tend to live a long life and they tend to die over a short period of debility. So they have a good life and a good death where they go to bed and they don't wake up rather than spending years dependent on everybody around them. Well said. Yeah. Health span and lifespan is what we're aiming for. You, you mentioned autophagy earlier, this, this self-eating process. Would there? I don't know if you do this with your clinic and your lab. Um, testing if a person is achieving autophagy. I know there's different ways to do it in a lab, like the LC3A protein, but would you say um, the average person who fasts and looks at blood glucose and ketones, could that be a gauge to show autophagy, or what are your thoughts on that? Well, I don't think it's possible to accurately measure autophagy in the way that you know people are representing. I think that this is an, uh, an even in animal studies with, without some of the biological limitations, I think it's a very difficult process at short term and long term, you can see the, the, the biomarker effects and, and, and whatnot. But I, so I don't know that it's possible to do the kind of studies that your people would really like to do where they measure minute by minute, you know, autophagic processes. And I said a lot of the processes the body used to get well actually create an acute response. Chronic problems become acute. And so you have to look at it, I think, over a bigger picture to get an accurate uh, assessment. Now, maybe we'll be able to develop non-invasive biomarkers that are reliable indicators of autophagy. But when you look at glucose and you look at neutrophil phagocytosis, and you look at these inflammatory markers, I think you can get a generalized picture. Um, but even, for example, the microbiome study we did in fasting, where we looked at microbiome changes before and then after and on follow-up, you get a thousand different organisms there. It's not even absolutely clear really? what the normal healthy flora is, let alone what are the short-term and long-term dynamic changes and what are their implications. I think people are, are taking a lot of liberty and mostly it's animal based studies and then interpreting it. Now, to our, from, it turns out there usually, it makes fasting look good, but I, you know, I just don't know how accurate um, or how reliable we can count on that in data interpretation is, as at least as far as the science stands today. That's fair. And you mentioned that gut testing there. How long were the fasts where you saw that change? Well, we have, um, the, the data we have was on uh, a couple dozen patients over uh, a period of weeks. So, you know, exactly. we had, uh, you know, it was a range of 10 to 20 days of fasting in there. But, you know, even that data is still just now coming in. And I know we're the only ones that have done long-term fasting looking at those microbiome changes. So I know that a lot of the speculations and pro uh, profiteering that's being done right now probably isn't based on really solid science yet. Earlier, you said that around day five, there's this metabolic adaptation that occurs. Could you explain a little bit more about what's happening there, Alan? Well, it starts actually about 16 hours into fasting as the body starts making radical changes. The biggest change, the biggest burner of glucose in a human being is its large bulbous neuronal net at the end of the spinal column called the brain. I mean, the human brain is like a glucose hog. It's just 
It's huge and it just burns tons of glucose. And if it was not for the body's ability to change fuels in the brain, you could only go about a week before you'd enter starvation, begin to break down vital proteins and die. Uh, and which is, by the way, chimps that don't make that biological conversion don't ever leave the tropics, do they? They need a constant supply of year-round food. Humans wandered all over the planet and all the humans that couldn't fast, that is convert their brain to burning fat, died. Every one of them. We know that because it's a biological adaptation. Anywhere you go on the planet, you look at a human being, take food away, within 16 hours, 24 hours, 48 hours, they begin this process of changing the brain fuel from burning glucose to burning fat. By the end of the second week of fasting, you're burning you know, two thirds or more of your energy in your brain is derived from fat. And as a consequence, a 70 kilogram male, instead of lasting a week, can last 70 days. Wow. Now, I'm not saying you should fast 70 days, but you could fast 70 days. It's how we can fast people routinely 40 days at the True North Health Center safely and effectively. So it's <clears throat> this biological adaptation of fasting was so critical to human beings that all the humans that didn't have that mechanism died. And now all it's, 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 you know, wired into our system. So, uh, all we've done is taken this very natural biological adaptation and applied it in a situation that never occurred before. And to, and was, until 200 years ago in the industrial revolution and changing the eating processed foods, there was no obesity. There is no obesity in nature. Even whales are only 9% body fat. They just happen to wear it on the outside of their body. The idea is that this aberrant uh, situation of obesity and developing these diseases of dietary excess is only a recent uh, phenomenon. And we've taken this ancient biological adaptation that just so happens it works to treat this modern disaster of high, eating highly processed foods. And it allows us to preferentially mobilize the visceral fat and reverse the condition. And interestingly enough, high blood pressure. We've got a study, 174 consecutive patients, 174 people achieved normal blood pressure without medication. Um, in fact, with stage three hypertension, where systolic blood pressure start at 180 or above, we have the largest effects that have ever been shown in treating hypertension in humans with an average effect size of 60 points. Essentially, everybody with hypertension, if they're willing to fast and eat well, are able to achieve normal blood pressure without medication usage. Di type 2 diabetes, about 80% of our type 2 diabetics, particularly those with hemoglobin A1C starting at 10 or less, will achieve normal blood sugar without medication. Now, granted, they have to do the radical and dangerous things like eat good and exercise and get enough rest to sustain it. But for those people willing to do those things, they can live without the pills and potions. Autoimmune diseases, rheumatoid arthritis, ulcerative colitis, ankylosing spondylitis, asthma, eczema, plaque, psoriasis, these conditions that are terribly managed, uh, in my opinion, uh, medically, because the way they manage autoimmune disease is to say, oh, your immune system is attacking your body, which is true. We will just shut down the immune system and you'll get some relief. And you do. And at first it's a dream and then it becomes a nightmare because it turns out you need your immune system. And when you shut the immune system off, you end up with problems far worse than the autoimmune disease they were originally treating. And so what we do instead is we say, let's get rid of the gut leakage and the inflammation that causes the tight junction leakage that stimulates the proteins to stimulate the immune system to attack itself. We use fasting. It resolves the inflammatory process. It normalizes the gut microbiome. And then let's go on a whole plant food SOS free diet and not create the oxidative damage that caused the inflammation to create the problem to begin with. And as a consequence, we can manage these autoimmune diseases, diseases far better off medications than they ever were on medications. They're not cured. What they are is managed. Mm. Just like you can't cure obesity. You can lose the weight and keep it off the rest of your life. But if you go back to eating greasy, fatty, processed, sugary foods, you're getting fat again. And you can normalize the blood pressure. But you go back to doing the things that cause it, it's coming back. And you can resolve autoimmune disease and manage autoimmune disease. But you, if you go back to doing the things that cause it, it's coming back. And the same thing's true with cancer. The truth is the only cure for cancer is prevention. And you can prevent cancer, you can delay it, you can defer it, and you can manage it, but you can't cure it. So, you know, we have a successfully long-term managed follicular lymphoma, for example, is a type of lymph cancer. We published a paper in the British Medical Journal 10 years ago on a woman that um, uh, got a good response to three weeks of fasting. We followed her three years. Uh, she maintained a cancer-free state. Now we followed her 10 years. She continues to be cancer-free. Wow. In fact, we've done now a whole... Uh, we've published a case series that's come out or is just coming out in the literature uh, this month. 
And we have uh, a couple dozen patients that we're following now because we've been doing a lot of lymphoma patients. This is a condition that responds well to fasting. The problem is you have to stick to the diet and lifestyle change in order to maintain the good results. But for those people that are willing to do that, the outcomes are very gratifying. Under medical treatment, there's no reduction in all-cause mortality. And you may get some tumor reduction initially, but then it blows up and you end up with a mess. So this is a better solution for some people. And we've been showing that it can be done safely and effectively. And, you know, again, I, if you go through British Medical Journal for the last, like, 100 years, you won't find any other case reports like that. In fact, what's interesting is that most doctors are just not used to people getting well because it's not part of the paradigm. They just assume you're on these drugs forever. That's it. They're getting well. What are you talking about? You know, that's, that's the residents that train at the Trinidad Health Center. That's the most common comment they make initially. It's, wow, I never saw anybody get better before. Wow. Minerals, minerals, minerals. You hear a lot of people out there speaking about the benefits of taking minerals. And it is important because in this day and age, our crops, our fruits, and our vegetables, they are depleted of minerals. So you've heard of the keto flu. You've heard of symptoms doing keto and fasting. People just don't feel good sometimes. This is the number one reason why. So my go-to for replenishing my electrolytes and my minerals, for enhancing my immune system, for gut support, for detoxification, is bean minerals. It has fulvic and humic compounds, and these have over 70 trace minerals and really important electrolytes to replenish your body with. Check out bean minerals over at beanminerals.com. Use the coupon code Azadi, my last name, at checkout to get a nice discount. That is A-Z-A-D-I at checkout over at beanminerals.com. You know, I, I love I love that you're getting to the cause here. That, that is the goal, right? And sometimes the symptoms could be far removed from the actual cause. You talked about high blood pressure. I remember when I interviewed Steve Hendricks a couple of years ago who wrote the book, The Oldest Cure in the World, right? He referenced right. you and your clinic, True yeah, North Clinic. And, and I, if you could correct me if I'm wrong here, but I believe in his book, he talked about pi airline pilots who would go to your clinic once a year too fast to control their blood pressure. Is that correct? Well, we certainly see a lot of pilots. Pilots have to maintain uh, normal blood pressure, maintain their licenses. They're, they're highly motivated, very disciplined people, so they do really well with what we advocate. The problem for pilots is they're traveling a lot. It's harder to eat healthy when you're traveling a lot and living out of hotels and stuff than you are if you, have, if you control your own domain. Yeah, that's really, really cool that you do that for pilots. Um, are you tracking blood glucose and ketones with your, the people who come to your clinic? Yeah, we monitor blood glucose uh, routinely. In fact, we're working with um, some partners that have some really sophisticated new technology uh, that we're going to incorporate in our next study, which is a, a, a you know a band that's worn that actually gives all kinds of different biofeedback. So that'll be that really we're really interested in increasing the non-invasive diagnostic tools that we're able to use. But blood glucose is something we routinely monitor, and blood glucose levels are going to drop in healthy people. Uh, sometimes as low as the teens, interestingly enough, but, you know, uh, normally above 35 milligram percent, but very low compared to the feeding state. Uh, in diabetics, one of the markers you can see, the, the more rapidly they're able to lower their blood sugar levels, uh, the less insulin resistance there is, the, the better they're likely to do. But some pa patients can be fasting even two, three weeks and still maintain hyperglycemia. They have so much insulin resistance. Yeah. yeah that's, so did you say that you've seen individuals enter their blood sugars get in the teens is that what you said yeah as, as low as the teens we don't we don't expect to see them okay. at 19 but that you know sometimes you will get very very low uh blood sugar levels uh and patients that are still doing clinically quite well it just freaks people out that are used to that kind of a feeding patient that would represent a really serious concern yeah uh, in fasting patients so blood sugar levels above 45 milligram percent are really quite routine and their ketones are up, right? Which is why they feel fine during that fast. Well, they're all going to go into ketosis. The only people that won't go into ketosis are, have metabolic derangement. If they have MCAD, medium chain acetylcoenzyme E, dehydrogenase deficiency, they wouldn't be able to break down fatty acids. They would start vomiting and they would die. So we don't do that because that would mess up our safety record. Yes. So we're very careful to screen everybody out. We don't fast patients that have metabolic defects that would prevent them from being able to doubt the fast. That's what I was saying, though. Everybody, before they do long-term fast, owes it to themselves to go through a history exam lab and monitoring. In fact, we offer a free service to people. If they go on to the True North Health website and fill out the registration forms, that gets us their medical history. I offer them a free phone conversation to kind of discuss with them, is this even an appropriate consideration, and point them in the direction 
of the option. If they want to come to the center, that's great. If they want to go to one of the other facilities, that's fine. If they want to do it at home, <clears throat> we have doctors that can work with them remotely in conjunction with their local doctor. Oh, cool. And that's part of, one of the reasons we wrote this book was so that the local doctors would have the information they needed to be able to guide their patients safely through this process. And the patients would have a, a reliable resource to understand what happens in fasting, what's our interpretation of those symptoms, what are the conditions that have been shown to be effective, what are the concerns we have, what are the contraindications, what are the things you need to be worried about. People that are going to do long-term fasting, they want to do it right, not screw it up, but they make fasting look really bad. Yeah. And the book, by the way, for those who are listening and not watching, it's called Can Fasting Save Your Life? And uh, where's the best place to get that book, Alan? Well, you can get it at their local booksellers. They can get it at Amazon.com. They can go to True North Health and they can get you know, uh, it through our website. Uh, you know, Wherever they want to get it, it's the same book. Yes. Yeah, we'll put a link for, uh, we'll put several links for y'all to get it. I remember when I first did my uh, first water fast in 2018, I, I, I did five days and I was looking at my glucose and ketones and my, my glucose dropped to around 52 milligrams per deciliters. My ketones were above normal. Yeah, 5.0 millimoles per liter. And it was, uh, it was like a spiritual experience for me. I, I remember, yeah. go ahead. No, no. Yeah. I remember, you know, on day three and day four, um, my fiance, who was my girlfriend at the time, she would tell me, how come you aren't, you aren't talking to me? And I would say like, I, I was just so much in my, like in my head and I was just like at peace that I was very introverted. Uh, and I, and it felt euphoric. It felt absolutely incredible when I went through my first water fast. You know, it's interesting. The Jews, the Jain, the Hindus, the Muslims, the Buddhists, the Christians don't agree on everything. But they all have a tradition about fasting. Fasting changes the way you feel about yourself and the world around you. We are a health facility, not a spiritual, you know, we don't tell people how to get into heaven or we don't pretend to have any great insight in how to direct people spiritually. But we do can't help but recognize the fact that people have profound experiences in the process of going through prolonged water only fasting. It definitely changes people's thought processes, you know, kind of from the inside out. Yeah, it does. And if you have never done it, if you do it medically supervised, is what we recommend. Uh, you'll experience what we're, we're, we're uh, referring to here. Alan. Um, We've had 25,000 patients come to the Trinidad Health Center. Wow. And so far, the 25,000 people in the last 40 years that have come through this facility, 25,000 people that walked in, 25,000 people have walked out. It's amazing. So we definitely have a protocol that's, that's shown if you follow the protocol, it can be done safely. That's amazing. I, I do different experiments for myself, and I'm not recommending this for anybody else. This is what I do, where I did a five day fast. I do I'll do like this is against what you just said about plant based, but I'll do like 90 days of a carnivore diet. Do testing and lab and gut testing before and after. Um, I want to do something with fasting personally. I don't know if five days is enough to get some data. I want to get your insights on that. If I should go longer and what are some data metrics that you would recommend I test for before and after? Well, there's a lot of data metrics. In fact, you know, we're just doing research and investigation into, you know, what the reliable indices are. We talked a lot, a lot of those uh, in the book and we're also have stuff we haven't put in the book yet that, you know, we're investigating. What I suggest to you is come to True North Health Center, go through history exam lab, do a fast as long as necessary, but as short as possible to be able to get optimum outcome. And, uh, you know, why don't you broadcast your experience of it, the good and the bad? Because, mm -hmm. you know, fasting can be a really intense process, especially for people that don't prep well. You know, a lot of the horror stories I hear from people fasting on their own is not because of the fasting. It's because, one, they may not have been a good candidate for fasting. They may not have baseline data so they can tell the difference between a good thing and a bad thing. So they ignore a bad thing that needs to be dealt with. They're too active in fasting. That's the most common problem. So they get dehydrated. Mm. Uh, and end up with problems that would be totally preventable. Or they do a great fast, they rest, they do everything right, but then they they refeed inappropriately. Mm. So they come on to ref and they'll get re you know post fasting edema, or they'll get um, you know theoretically refeeding syndrome, which can be fatal. So yeah. you know, we really don't want people to do that. It takes half the length of the fast to refeed properly. So a 20 day fast requires 10 days of controlled refeeding. The reason why we have such a good success record is we make sure that only appropriate candidates fast. We make sure people rest when they fast or monitor properly. And we make sure they refeed properly. And that means progressively. And it's very, you know, it takes some discipline to do that in a home setting. And in a controlled setting, it's a little bit easier. And that's why we don't ever see refeeding syndrome. We don't have problems with, 
you know, all the problems that people talk about with fasting. And that's why Walter Longo said, don't do long-term fasting yeah. unless you do it at the True North Health Center, because that's where we know we're going to follow a reasonable protocol. If you're going to do it at home, do it in conjunction with your local doctor, following the protocols laid out in the book. And if you want, we have doctors that will work with you remotely through Zoom to provide coaching, you know, in terms of if symptoms come up, you can have somebody that has experience. Because unfortunately, a lot of the doctors will be able to do the testing and screening, but they wouldn't have much experience with people actually getting well, so they don't, aren't, don't always know what they're looking at. Well said. Very, very important. What do you? What are your thoughts on having coffee, tea, and or supplements during a fast? Well, we want to avoid all highly addictive nervous system drugs during fasting: C cocaine, methamphetamines, heroin, and definitely caffeine. Caffeine would be a totally inappropriate uh, substance, and so coffee would absolutely not be uh, something you. Well, you, I wouldn't recommend you drink it ever, frankly. But yeah, especially oh, really? not during fasting. Absolutely not. No, caffeine has some very coffee and caffeine themselves. I, you know, people make a fuss about the fact that coffee comes from a plant-based food, so it has some good things in it. It has some antioxidants, and for people eating greasy, fatty, processed diets, that may be the only plant-based foods they're eating. You know, for some people, that's it. So that's all their antioxidants. The fact that there's some good properties to coffee doesn't make it a good thing. And caffeine has a is a highly addictive nervous system stimulant. It has a seven-hour half-life. It's Coffee, very acid, highly irritating to the gastroenterologist. Ask anybody with gastritis or something how they feel about drinking coffee. And um, it interferes with the sleep quality. I would argue against uh, the use of coffee as any kind of health promoting food product. But certainly during fasting, it would be contraindicated. We ask people to stop at least two days before they start fasting because coffee is, caffeine is so addictive. In fact, it can really interfere with the uh, onset of your fasting experience. A lot of the problems people think they have fasting isn't fasting. It's getting off the drugs that they're addicted to, including caffeine. Have you looked and at... So during fasting, we're using distilled water only. Distilled water. Okay. Distilled or highly purified water. You could use any excellent purification process to get rid of the hydrocarbons and the heavy metals and all the other crap that you don't want to be taking during fasting. We found that fasting patients become very sensitive. They won't tolerate municipal water. And so what we'll do is we'll use laboratory grade fractionated distilled water, which is really like rainwater would be if the atmosphere wasn't polluted. Are you uh, adding any any uh, electrolytes or salt to the water? No, absolutely not. We okay. specifically don't add electrolytes or give supplements during fasting because that's part of the reason we've had such good safety with 25,000 people. If you supplement an isolated nutrient like sodium or potassium, what you've done is you've eliminated using those rate limiting nutrients as markers, biomarkers for fasting. And now when you're monitoring fasting, you can't say, oh, potassium is going, now it's time to move on to juice or broth or other things and get all the nutrients. Uh -huh. So you can have a micronutrient you're not tracking and become a rate limiting factor. In fact, that's where the cardiac disease and water fasting under medical supervision occurred because they did long-term fasting. They were supplementing it because they let their arrogance exude their ignorance. And now they put people through a, a longer period of time than the rate limiting micronutrient was. What we've learned is there are certain nutrients that we monitor that are rate limiting nutrients. If they're okay, all the other downstream stuff tends to be okay. So if you supplement those micronutrients, you no longer have the ability to use those as rate limiting nutrients and you're making the patient vulnerable to deficiency or depletion where we don't see that because of this protocol we use. And again, that's why we wrote the book so that people could have a clear understanding of a proven and safe and effective method for undergoing fasting effectively. Almost all the criticisms you're gonna hear about fasting, and there's plenty of it, is because people either aren't screened properly, they don't rest properly, they don't hydrate properly, or they refeed improperly. If you solve that, you get what we get. It's 25,000 patients in a row where everybody that walks in walks out. Yeah, well said. Have you looked at heart rate variability during a longer fast? Um, yeah, we haven't published anything on heart rate variability yet, but there is an approximate, I mean, there isn't a, a dramatic changes in heart rate vulnerability. We've looked at isolated individual patients. And so I imagine if we look at that, in a, in a more formal way that we can start talking about the improvements that occur. But um, unfortunately, that hasn't been on our, our uh, you know, it's not one of the biomarkers we've been tracking. Yeah, just a thought. I'll just Because I look at my, I'm just be interested in what happens there during a fast. Um, what about those who do these longer fasts and their sleep starts to, um, they sacrifice their sleep a bit, they can't fall asleep, they wake up in the night, middle of the night, and they feel energized. Uh, what's happening there and what, what should they do? Well, it is true that the need for sleep probably reduces as you get into a meditative and fasting state. 
uh, there's the need for rest doesn't change, but the need for mm. actual hours of sleep. Many times people come in with sleep apnea and all kinds of serious sleep disruption problems that often resolve, one with weight loss and two with reduced inflammation. Uh, so although sleep is often disrupted during fasting itself, uh, it often is profoundly in enhanced as a consequence of fasting. And so we treat a lot of sleep disruption with fasting. Although again, during fasting itself, your brain is burning ketones and your brain's probably saying, what the hell are you doing? Go get us some calories. We're hemorrhaging strategic fat reserves. Right. And so it's going to do everything it can to get you alert and get you out there and, and, and solve the problem. Your brain doesn't know that you're doing this thing purposely. It's being, it's thinking we're just in a starvation mode. Right on. That makes total sense to me. Um, what's the longest fast you've seen somebody do? Well, the longest fast that I personally have supervised is 44 days, but the gentleman I trained with fasted people as long as 103 days. Wow. And he used to, he used to routinely fast people in 60 days. And I asked him when I got there, this was 40 years ago. I asked him, why are you no longer fasting people over 40 days or very rarely over 40 days? And he said, because of sleep deprivation. Hmm. And I said, Oh, do the patients have trouble with sleeping? He goes, not the patients, me. <laughs> and he would worry more about patients. As you get into a longer fast, that is a fast between 40 and 60 days, electrolyte balance, everything's a lot more delicate. Mm. And so he, he just, um, just stopped doing that. He just limited it to 40 days. And then he would refeed him and do it again if he had to do another 40 days. And we've been following that protocol for 40 years, and it works really well. We don't, we only very rarely do we go over 40 days, and only if we have to, you know, if the circumstances give us no choice. Yeah, that's so funny. What about uh, fasting for cancer? I know you mentioned a little bit earlier, but can fasting starve cancer? How long would it be? I know it's different for everybody. We're not making medical claims. Okay, but... the only cancer that we've published on mm -hmm. is the only cancer that we can publish on ethically right now, which is lymphoma. And the reason is there is no effective treatment for lymphoma. Treating drugs for lymphoma doesn't necessarily affect all-cause mortality. And so not treating is not considered unethical, all right? And so we can take patients and get them well without being considered unethical. And that's how we were able to publish those papers in the British Medical Journal. Had it been a different type of tumor, it would have been very difficult to publish because if there's a standard accepted medical protocol that people think is actually of some benefit, then to deny people that benefit would be considered you know, unethical. So right now, we're, we only talk about lymphoma and related conditions because that's what we've actually published outcome data on. Now we've treated, you know, hundreds of patients that have various types of cancers. And what's interesting is a lot of times these tumors will go away, but the problem is, you know, that's not black and white either. A lot of breast tumors are misdiagnosed as, have, as breast cancer when they really were more fibrotic. And, you know, it's not always a black and white situation. A lot of our people are coming in pre biopsy and whatnot, and they've been told they have cancer, but you know, when it goes away, is it cancer? Was it maybe something else? I'll give you an example. We had a patient recently who published this paper. It's on the list. She had a, a tumor that showed up. She's having abdominal pain. They did the scan, found a tumor. They needed to do a biopsy, but it was in a delicate place. The guy they wanted to have do it wasn't available right away. So instead of that, we fasted her. And it turned out the fast was so effective, it reduced the mass so that there was nothing left to biopsy. Hmm. But because we hadn't biopsied it, you, you know, it's very difficult to publish the case report because you didn't know what kind of tumor it was that was going away. Something went away, but you know, and so a lot of times what we do is we'll fast somebody. If everything goes away, we leave them the hell alone. If it doesn't, then they go in and, and do their lumpectomy or whatever it is they do. Now we also get people that have had, like our, our patients we're publishing have all been, you know, well-documented. They've had their biopsies, their excisional biopsies and all that stuff. And it goes away. So at least with lymphoma, we can say conclusively, and at least our patients, you know, it goes away. So, you know, that's been very rewarding. The problem is to keep it away requires people to continue yeah. the diet and lifestyle changes. Like this patient that we have a 10 year follow up, I told her she had to stick to the diet strictly or it could be fatal because I would track her down and kill her. And she believed me. And so she stuck to the diet. I just saw her actually here in the clinic a couple of days ago awesome. and she's doing great. She looks great. She's uh, doing a wonderful job. And, you know, she's gone public with her story, which is how we've got so many people coming in to treat with lymphoma because she she told her story. And we, they actually had some folks here that were filming the new movie, um, um, Uninformed Consent. Mm. So it's a new movie that's being filmed. They filmed some stuff here. 
and they interviewed her, you know, as an example. And it's basically cancer, all about cancer and, and alternatives and conventional treatment and all that. So it's a, it's one of these documentaries on, on cancer. And uh, so she, she did a great job, you know, telling her story, her experience. That's amazing. Um, I could see, I could see you just light up sharing that. It, it looks like it. Well, it's well, she's a such a nice person. It's so nice that she was, you know, and you know, her was actively discouraged by the oncologist and stuff originally. Now they've kind of have a whole different story. So, you know, yeah. once people get well, but you know, for many doctors, it'll be the only patient they've ever seen actually get well. Right. And so once they see somebody get well, they often get very enthusiastic and then they'll actually start sending us patients because, you know, that's not part of their paradigm. Yeah, that's why your book is such a great resource for for those who want to practice fasting and your doctor is so opposed to it. Like, gift that book to your doctor. Give the doctor read the book. Yeah. It does change their opinion. Share this conversation with them, too. Yeah. Uh, what are your you thoughts? You need to find a doctor that reads, though. Not all the doctors right. will read. But if they can read and they actually read it, they'll, they'll be impressed. And if they are not open to it, then you just go contact uh, Alan here, <laughs> True North Clinic. Uh, they'll find somebody for you. Or maybe we can help them find a new doctor. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of doctors now, these lifestyle medicine doctors that have basically adopted diet and lifestyle as an important issue. I know that, you know, most people don't believe doctors, you know, are like that, but there are a few out there. And so sometimes you can find one of those and then it, it's much more gratifying because they're open to the idea of actually helping you get well. Absolutely. What are your thoughts on dry fasting? I don't think dry fasting is physiologically uh, sound because the detoxification process requires a solute for the body to take the toxic material from the cell, process it through the kidney and put it in the urine. If you're going to purify the blood through the kidneys and there's not an adequate fluid, if you're dehydrated, you're going to be at increased risk for kidney shutting down. And in fact, one of the popular proponents of dry fasting that died recently, there was a bunch of stuff on the internet about that was, you know, kidney failure secondary to hmm. dehydration. So. It doesn't make any sense to me at all that you would purposely dehydrate the, the system and put that body under that kind of physiological stress. Now, granted, people are reporting good benefits with dry fasting, but I report anytime you stop eating greasy, fatty, processed, sugary <laughs> junk, you're going to start getting some benefit. Fair. And anytime uh, you, you restrain from that behavior, so there'll be some benefit. But you're also going to put yourself at risk, uh, uh, particularly extend that dry fast into the state of uh, dehydration. So. I don't recommend dry fasting at all. In fact, we minimum, we require at least 40 ounces of fluid to be consumed water and we monitor urine and we monitor specific gravity and we're monitoring blood to make sure people stay in a reasonably hydrated state. And again, we've got data to support our outcome. I'd like to see published data supporting outcome uh, with uh, what fasting. I consider physiologically sound uh, dehydration. So, you know, we, we disagree strongly with, with that. And I think that's a, a, a mistake that's made and you will see serious consequences of patients if they follow that advice. It, it, is every form of dry fasting you're opposed to or like like an intermittent fast, 12 hours? Uh, well, that's eight hours of kind of fasting dry overnight. But what about like a short-term 16-hour dry? Are you still opposed to a shorter fast that's a dry fast? Well, I don't object to anything as long as you maintain adequate hydration. So if the if objective markers of hydration are adequate, you know, and you're able to do that, magically without drinking, that's great. And I don't know that in 12 and 16 hours, you're going to run into the kind of problems we're talking about. Yeah. You know, I'm talking about prolonged water only fasting and these people are fasting people five days or up to 10 days. And, and that's pretty and radical because they're getting benefits of fasting. That doesn't mean they're getting optimum benefits. And again, the risk, nobody's done safety data on it. There's no really good outcome data that I've seen. And so I think that you, if you're going to advocate something that radical, I think you should at least do what, like what we did is we did a fasting safety study. We looked at all the adverse events, all the consequences in patients over a period of five years, and we were able to publish a study, the only fasting safety study on long-term water only fasting. And if you use that protocol, you can expect to get the same results we get. When you see articles and headlines that come out throughout the years, I know JAMA had an article a few years ago about fasting doesn't work for weight loss. Uh, recently, I believe it was an abstract from the American Heart Association sharing that fasting increases heart oh. disease risk by 91% or so. These these headlines, like, what are your Actually, thoughts when they come? Actually, look at that study. That I was a co-author of that study that said uh, that the conclusion was fasting might increase cardiovascular disease risk. That was actually a study done at our facility that showed inflammatory markers go up during fasting. And they were postulating that that might be a problem. We have subsequently done a study where we looked at that population with six-week follow-up data. 
And of course, yes, it goes up in fasting. It comes down after fasting. It wow. ends up even lower. And there's no increased risk of heart vascular death. So that was a postulated headline. But you know, understand if you want to get published in a JAMA, coming out with an attack on fasting, a lot more likely to get published than coming out with something that says it's a good thing. This so is true. You got to take all this stuff with a grain of kelp. So it's not <laughs> that the data was inaccurate. The conclusion was um, uh, not, not necessarily inaccurate, but the conclusion was based on not having looking at the long-term follow-up data. So, you know, there's a lot of politics that go on in, in this research, but as far as cardiovascular disease, we have the long-term outcome risk factors and you're, you know, and we've got 40 years of tracking 25,000 people. I think we'd definitely be seeing if there are risk factor increases. And yeah. It's not at all supported by our data. So, well, the thing at is, least, like I said, I, I knew this was going to come up and I said, well, at least I can acknowledge the fact that I was actually conducting the, collecting the data <laughs> that was used to, it's funny, Alan, because I, I didn't realize you were a, a co-author on that. Yeah, <laughs> so, we'll pull that study and, and then look at our follow-up date on the very same topic and then see what your conclusion is. I love it. I'm so glad you cleared that up. <laughs> and it's true. You know, we have these headlines and it's because you can't really, you can't put fasting into a pill, into a medication. <clears throat> so there's... But they're desperately trying to do that. In fact, right now, that's one of the reasons fasting has been transmuted from being criminal quackery to cutting edge research is because there's no question that fasting profoundly uh, is affecting these processes and they desperately want to come up with what we're called fasting mimicking drugs. Hmm. So drugs that do to the body what fasting does, but in a form that they can sell. Like rapamycin, for example? There's a lot of uh, drugs that are being prematurely advocated as fasting mimicking drugs. And unfortunately, you're going to find that the, the, when the long-term data comes in, I think they're going to be very disappointed uh, in the, uh, you know, health consequences of these, you know, completely well-meaning, but I think misguided attempts at trying to manipulate physiology. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be interesting to see that. What are some other testimonials for, you've had over 25,000 people go through your clinic. What are some other that stand out testimonials, like just remarkable healing during these fasts that, that come to mind? Well, you know, we, we have these patients every day, but I think rather than giving anecdotal case reports, which are meaningless, just look at the number of studies we've published with large numbers of people in carefully controlled settings. If you have cardiovascular disease, if you have type two diabetes, if you have autoimmune disease, if you have chronic pain syndromes, um, you know, one of the cases we published was a great case. This was a dentist who went to a continuing education seminar at an outside venue and got hit in the head with a tent pole, ended up with a durable tear and had not surprisingly a headache. The problem with the headache was it didn't go away. 16 years of constant daily head pain at eight out of 10 or to 10 out of 10 pain every minute of every day for 16 years debilitated around the pain non-responsive to all the drugs and the pain medication and ultimately comes in and fasts. we fast her for the first 19 days she has no relief in pain same pain pain day 19 she wakes up for the first time in 16 years she has five minute little window of no pain and then the pain came back we end up fasting her 41 days. At the end of that, she has no acute pain, but she still has some prodromal symptoms. We fed her for six months, built her back up, and then we did a second 40-day water-only fast. Now it's been 15 years, she has no head pain. Wow. She has been a headache for 15 years. She's um, a really good example, though, of, you know, sometimes it takes a lot. Now, it was funny, she did 41 days. She was one of the few patients I like over 40 days, and the reason was, at day 40, I said, okay, well, we have to break your fast now. And she says, no, she needs to do more. And I said, no, we only fast 40 days. She goes, no, no, no. The men fast for 40 days. Moses, David, Elijah, Jesus. Women always have to do just a little more. <laughs> and so we let her go to day 41 as an exception. And the second time we, we stuck to 40. But, um, you know, we, since then, of course, you know, we've seen a lot of people with chronic cephalogia. Um, and... It's not 100%, but a high percentage of people that have these inflammatory conditions often do respond during fasting. And so they sell us, they, the, trend, the clinic name should be changed from the True North Health Center to the last resort, you know, because oftentimes we're kind of the last place somebody will come. I want to change the name to spontaneous remission. <laughs> I love that. That's usually what a lot of physicians tell their patients was, oh, well, you got better at spontaneous remission, you know. Because obviously diet and lifestyle couldn't have anything to do with getting well. Right. Yeah. Uh, I love that. 
What are you seeing with uh, the tongue during a, a longer fast? Well, the tongue will um, uh, reflect activity in the gastrointestinal system, so it'll coat up. And eventually, when you get towards the end of fasting, the tongue will clear, but that's not because necessarily you're clear. It's because you're not producing enough protein, you know, you're not reproducing cells fast enough. And so we'll get kind of a glossy appearance. That, that's not something we're necessarily looking for. So the tongue clearing is more probably about the reproductive capacity of cell proliferation. People have often taken it as a marker of, of gastrointestinal toxicity, and there are changes in the tongue that reflect the GI tract, ridging and cracking and stuff, but just waiting for the, the clear tongue is not a reliable indicator to tell when to break your fast. It's just a reliable indicator that you may be getting close to converting from fasting to starving. That's really interesting. Yeah, I've, I've seen some people talk about the tongue. With, with, a, with a longer fast and hunger, uh, what are you seeing on average where people are the hungriest and then the least hungriest during a fast? Well, there's no hunger in long-term fasting because the hunger blunting mechanism of fasting of ketosis, that's why the fasting mimicking diets are using this. They put people on high fat, high protein diets and there's no carbohydrates. So they go into ketosis just like in fasting. So they get a fasting mimicking blunting of hunger. And so short-term they can get some weight loss. Of course, the problem is high protein, high fat diets long-term have very serious problems. And so it's not necessarily something you would tell people to just eat a carnivore diet forever because of the downstream of high protein, high fat, you know, serious health compromise. But uh, in the short run, you get a fasting mimicking effect. So in fasting, there's no hunger. These patients are fasting. They haven't eaten for two or three weeks. They're going to food preparation classes. They're going to the dining room and socializing with people and have no problems. It's not, there's no, blood sugars are perfectly stable. They're fine. Got to love those ketones. Yeah. I want to take a quick break from the video you're watching to share something with you that has made a big difference with my health and the thousands and thousands of students that I teach all across the world. Now, this is a unique device that has been shown to help with skin health, sore muscles, wrinkles, psoriasis, eczema, scoliosis, migraines, sleep issues, arthritis, acne, scar tissue, wound healing, relaxation, and also boost testosterone levels. It's red light therapy. Turn it on, and as you can see, I just leave it there on my desk as I work. 10, 20 minutes uh, per day will suffice. Then head over to bondcharge.com slash ketocamp and use the coupon code ketocamp to get 15% off your red light device. So whether it's these Bond Charge blue light blocking glasses, their sauna blanket, or any of their awesome products, use that coupon code ketocamp at checkout. We'll drop a link down below. Go check them out. They are awesome. And let's get back to today's video. You mentioned earlier a little bit about the gut microbiome. And I'd love for you to share, Alan, the energy and the processes that are needed to digest food and what happens when you start to practice either a long water fast or even just intermittent fasting, how that repairs the gut microbiome. Well, you know, that, that research is really just is just being done. In fact, as I said, our, our research, the one that you talked about with inflammation and cardiovascular disease, that's the first in a series of papers we did with Washington University. Oh, really? And the next one is actually looking at the specific organisms and the changes that occur with fasting and what kind of flora you have. So that's not even been published. That's just being done. And it's really complicated because it's still not clear. When you have 72% of the population being obese or overweight and only 2.7% of the population eating even reasonably healthy diets, it's hard to know what even normal is. So there's a lot of um, work still to be done in terms of interpreting this data. Now, I know a lot of people have already interpreted it and they're selling their prebiotics and they're selling their probiotics and they've got all kinds of definitive answers out there. But I can tell you, I don't think it's quite as black and white as sometimes people are being led to believe. How long have you been teaching fasting? Say again? How long have you been teaching fasting? Well, I've been teaching, uh, I'm an adjunct faculty at a number of schools, <clears throat> excuse me, University of Western States, which is DC, ND school in Portland, Bastyr University uh, in Seattle. And I've been teaching for them for about, uh, well, I imagine 30 years. Wow. So, yeah. And uh, I've been practicing for 40 years uh, at the True North Health Center. And before that, you know, I went to chiropractic college and then I went to osteopathic college in Australia. So I did my training in Australia and worked with Alec Burton, who was the world's leading experienced, most experienced person using long-term water-only fasting. That's why I went there. 
And so I had some years there, uh, you know, in a, in a different environment. But we've been here at the True North Health Center for 40 years. Wow. So I got interested in this when I was 16 years old. I was in school. And, um, you know, some of kids on the spectrum, like me, get interested in spiders or dinosaurs. I happen to get interested in this idea that health had causes, that you could cause health just like you can cause disease. Mm -hmm. And that the cause of health was healthful living, diet, sleep, exercise, and fasting. And that fasting helped undo the consequences of things that maybe people didn't completely control. So I got very interested in that. And I was inspired by my uncle, who was a medical doctor. And um, I, I told him when I was 16 that I was going to go into this alternative medicine field. And he said, no, I wasn't. He said, nobody in our family went to doctors like that, let alone became doctors like that. And he said, better I should be a communist spy. He really said that? Yeah, I should better I should be a communist spy than to do something like that. That was the worst thing he could possibly think of. My father, who was a very serious guy, took me aside when he heard this argument and he said, son, your uncle is a very prominent physician and he doesn't think much of this alternative stuff. He goes, I don't know anything about alternative stuff, but anything that makes him that angry and mad, it can't be bad. So you stick to your guns and good luck to you. So my uncle, when I'm in school in Australia and I'm treating hypertension for Dr. Burton, I'm telling him, uncle, these people are getting better. He says, no, they're not. I said, yes, they are. I'm taking their blood pressure. He says, then you don't know how to take blood pressure. He said, I've been in practice for 50 years. They never get better. So I think I'll show him. So I come back. We start doing this study. We spend 12 years collecting data. We work up with T. Colin Campbell from Cornell University who becomes comes in, helps us, and we finally get this paper. He won't, my uncle will not even look at the data. He won't help us. Wow. No, he will not waste his time unless it's published in a peer-reviewed journal. We finally get this paper accepted for publication in a peer-reviewed journal. Two months before it comes out, he dies of a massive heart attack. Oh my gosh. My mother swears he died just so we wouldn't have to admit he was wrong. <laughs> That's crazy. That's a crazy story. Oh my gosh. Well, he's watching you I somewhere. I think he died because of the blintzes, the kugel, the crap block, the sugar, you know, but we'll never know. What can I say? Oh, what a story. That is wild. <laughs> uh, I have a couple more questions as we land the plane here. Um, uh, first of all, share with my audience um, where they could learn more about you. TrueNorthClinic.com, uh, the book. True North Health. True North True North com. Excuse me. Where else can they learn more about you? If they go to truenorthhealth.com and they fill out the registration forms, we offer a free phone conversation. We can do a screening. We have a free Roku channel so they can download our lectures. We have free live streaming. They can look at the lectures we're giving each day at the True North Health Center. It's all free. It's None of it's monetized. All through that, that website. They can order our books, The Pleasure Trap or the Can Fast and Save Your Life book. Um, and um, if you also, if you go onto YouTube and just say, you know, Dr. Goldhammer and Fasting, you'll find like, just a ton of uh, interviews and, and, and talks that have been done. So there's no shortage of content out there. It's all freely available. It's all readily accessible. And truenorthhealth.com is a, is a, we also have a, a nonprofit uh, uh, research organization called the True North Health Foundation. And it has a website, fasting.org, which is nothing more than a compendium site of all the research on fasting. So, you know, again, you can get all the information you want to get you can call me. I'll be happy to try to answer your questions. That's wonderful. We'll put all that down below. So a couple of things here. Um, I'm currently writing a new book called Metabolic Freedom, and it's on what you, what you said, right? 90, 93%, 88 to 93% of Americans are uh, metabolically unhealthy. It'll be out with Hay House next year, June 2025. The, the principle is, is metabolic freedom, right? This metabolic flexibility. You outlined it so well today, and you do it so brilliantly in your work. And um, I want to ask you, what are your three favorite ways to achieve this metabolic freedom concept? Well, number one is diet. And our particular version of the diet is a whole plant food diet without salt, without sugar, without oil, without alcohol. So we basically tell people, think of anything you really find gives you joy or comfort and get rid of it. <laughs> um, the second thing is exercise. And it doesn't matter to me which kind of exercise, but walking, hiking, biking, swimming, things that stress you aerobically, that give you balance, strength, flexibility, you know, preferably a combination of things, very, very important. And I think the third most important thing is actually sleep. Mm. I think that that's one of the most underrated activities. And you should get enough sleep that you can wake spontaneously feeling refreshed. If you have to wake up and use a highly addictive nervous system stimulate to function, you're not getting enough rest and sleep. 
And if you do diet, sleep and exercise, and then use fasting every day for 16 hours and maybe once a year, if you're healthy for a week or if you're not healthy, however long it takes, I think that you can avoid the last 20 years of debility that screw most people. You know, I'm 65 years old now and I see it all around me. I play basketball with people that are 20 years younger. They're already aging out. <clears throat> They're already having difficulties. So if you want to spend the last 20 years of your life being healthy and functional, I think the best chance to do that is to follow these protocols that we've laid out here and the information that we provide in our book can fast and save your life. You're uh, you're a basketball fan. You play basketball. I love basketball four times a week. Oh, I love it. I'm a big basketball fan too. I have a hoop right behind me in my in my driveway here. I was just shooting some hoops before uh, we hopped on the call here. Well, I have to say the way I got into this was I was in fourth grade and Dr. Lyle, our our psychologist, used to beat me badly in basketball, and I thought I would get an edge. That's why I read Shelton's book, and it turned oh. out it failed completely because he adopted the same diet. He still kicks my ass every time we play. <laughs> you know, it's funny. I just, I shot, I thought, you know, I can't beat him. He's quick. He's good. He's better. Okay. So I thought I'll beat him at free throws. Cause you know, that's just practice and some mental conditioning. So I practiced for six months, 500 free throws. A day. I just got some coaching. I worked on my breathing and I thought, okay, he hasn't played for a week. I take him aside. I say, Hey dad, let's have a free throw shooting contest. And he said, okay, I don't care. <clears throat> so we go out there. I hit 48 out of 50 and I think I got it. It's pretty good. He hits 18, misses one, and then he hits 80 in a row. No way. <laughs> yeah. He hasn't played in a week. 99 out of, of course, I tell him, you're such a choke. If you can hit 99 out of 100, just hit 100, for God's <laughs> sake, you know? So the point is, it didn't work for me to beat Dr. Lyle in basketball. But um, I don't think it's helped me continue to be able to play competitively, even though I'm, you know, dramatically older than the people that that's that awesome. Playing. We got to play one of these days. Every every Sunday, oh, yeah. me and my friends here in Miami Beach, we go to the park and we play. But I'm always shooting hoops for myself. We got to figure out a way to play with hey, each other. Ready to go. <laughs> Come on up here. We'll, 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 we'll have a go at it. We'll make it happen. We'll make it. I'm, I'm pretty tall. I got long arms. I'm six foot two. It's okay. <laughs> okay. Last question is this. Um, in, in my book that I'm writing, there's a chapter on how your thoughts influence health or disease. And I talk about this this supplement. Um, I call it a supplement. I call it vitamin G, Alan, and that's vitamin gratitude and all of the healing, incredible anti-inflammatory benefits of feeling and appreciating and experiencing a grateful heart and a grateful mind. Yeah. So I want to ask you, what do you have vitamin G gratitude for today, Alan? Well, you know, I think on that point, I think it's a really important point because I think that attitude, which is influenced by gratitude, determines action. Mm. Now, ultimately, it's action that determines outcome, but it's hard to take action if you have a poor attitude. And so, you know, for me, I'm really grateful for a number of things. Number one, I'm still able to practice because when I started 40 years ago, I was a criminal quack. And now I'm a cutting edge researcher. So there's been a big evolution about the way fasting is viewed. And so the ability to continue to fast people, uh, for me, I'm very grateful to because I really like it. It's, it's a lot of fun getting people that are having challenges and seeing them overcome it and then seeing them to maintain it. And also I'm grat grateful now that we've been able to publish in peer reviewed literature because in, in 40 years ago, I'm not sure I could have gotten a subscription to some of these journals, let alone have them publish my papers. Wow. And the thing about publishing in peer reviewed journals is it really pisses off a lot of people. And I'm really gra grateful to that too, because <laughs> there's a lot of people, particularly there are bullies out there that I particularly enjoy seeing have to kind of reevaluate um, their preconceptions. And so, uh, you know, there's a lot for us to be grateful to today. There's probably never been a better time to be doing this kind of alternative medicine work, not the least of which is the, is a podcast, because in the old days, a person like me would give lectures to 50 people or maybe 500 people. Mm. Whereas I've given, uh, talks now that have four and 5 million views, which means I would have had to spend 400 years the mm. old way trying to communicate these ideas where now as you can go on a podcast like this and reach pe more people than you could have reached in a lifetime uh, and in a way where they can get access to the information just by clicking on a website uh, without any cost or burden. And so I think it's a very um, equalizing kind of power that we have with information. And you know, we're in the information business. It's about giving people information. The, they do the work, their body does the healing. All we have to do is try to take credit for the good result. It's a great gig.
If you enjoyed that interview, you're going to love this interview with Dr. Ben Bickman, all about the scientific way to burn belly fat extremely fast. These are disorders that our ancestors would have never known. At the risk of being political, this is one of the consequences of capitalism, where capitalism is so good in improving people's lives that now we're suffering maybe the one consequence of it, which is that we have too much.